So let's get started. Uh, so here's the scenario. Your coworker gets hit by a bus. Or as we like to call it, where I work, win the lottery. And you are then tasked with taking care of their code, what they left behind. Uh, so when I'm placed in this situation, not that I've known anyone that's got hit by a bus, thankfully, uh, but when I have somebody that presents new code to me, they're saying, or like, uh, I, John, I want you to look at this, or I'm evaluating an open source project, or I'm evaluating a new library, or somebody comes to the group with code that they want me to look at. I, uh, you first need to have a lay of the land, right? So somebody came to me with this toy project that they had, and they said, what do you think? How can I make this better? And I thought, ah. So I you know, sat there and looked at it, and had them walk me through it for about five minutes, and a bunch of things stuck out to me. And I thought that this would be a really great example to share with the group. So what I want to do is walk through how we can take something like this, where we have a bunch of different methods and a bunch of class properties, and reduce it back down to sanity. Or at least something that's much easier to look at and infer what it does, rather than how it does it. And um, Dan, you'll probably hate me for this, but my Wi-Fi my wi doesn't work on here, so I can't pull up your Google presentation to walk through the kata of how all this stuff works. But essentially, the problem is that this class is trying to solve is it takes a bunch of balls, imagine them like soccer balls, basketballs, whatever, and distributes them into buckets according to certain configuration parameters. You then run the algorithm, and it gives you the output. So I guess that's what it's supposed to do. And this class name is bucket ball distribution. Anyway, so this is your canvas. You, we've got a lot of different methods here. And what I like to do when I first get a piece of code is hopefully it has tests with it. If it doesn't have tests with it, I have a, a sad time. But if it has tests with it, those are very, very good resources for how the code works. Hopefully the developer that wrote those tests wrote them with as well-named methods as this person did. So I can literally read one of those and just say, test distribute one bucket to one app. Now I'm not sure what an app is in this application. <laughs> so I, I think the scenario actually for this was um, voters to voting applications or something like that. Uh, or judges to apps. Judges to applications. So, um, Anyway, these are, they're, these are pretty well-named tests. They're, they're use case driven. They kind of tell me what the interior of that code method will be doing. Um, so let's look at one of these tests. We're gonna look at this first one because it's hopefully the most simple use case. So we have this test here. Uh, we've got some private properties there at the top which look like different states that are then eventually set in the methods. The setup command, or the setup method up there, is run before every test case, and this is a convention of PHP unit. So we can bet that when PHP unit goes to run this method, that setup method is going to be called and assign this bucket ball distribution object. You'll hear me screw that up a ton of times today. This bucket ball distribution object to this property disk, which I guess is for distribution. So then this code starts going through and executing. It has some buckets that it assigns with an ID and some balls that it assigns with an ID. It runs this method called run distribution, which was rather peculiar to me at first, which it turns out it's a private function on this test class, which then executes four different methods for set bucket ID, set ball ID, set minimum balls per bucket, and set min buckets per ball. And then it finally executes the run method. And after it does that, it returns the result. So I went through the different test, test functions um, here, and it turns out that every single test case uses the same pattern. And I thought to myself, hmm, so run distribution is called every time one of these other tests is run to. And I thought to myself, this is, this is actually masking the pain of what's going on with the object under test. And you might think, well, what do, I, what do you mean by that, John? It's dry, right? Like dry is good. We don't want to have code duplication. But in this case, I really think that the code duplication is actually hiding and masking the fact that the object you have on your test is poorly designed. You shouldn't need to have a bunch of different methods that could call in a certain order to then run the class. We can design it in a better way to enforce that through the design of the code, rather than religiously knowing you have to call these four methods with a value before running our, 
running our uh, run method and everything. So what we're going to do is we're going to end up walking through how to refactor this class to do that. In this case, what I wanted to do is I wanted to expose the pain of this class. So I took, I went back through and I took all the run distribution methods in the class or in the method bodies and I replaced them with the long version of the code. So it comes back and now we're setting bucket IDs, ball IDs, etc. in each of our test cases. So now I can get a feel for what's required in each, case, in, in each case. I could go through and remove some of these different methods if I wanted to say, hmm, what happens if I remove this? Run the test and see if it breaks. So I saved you the time of not having done that. But after that, what I got to looking at was, hmm, so I see here we're assigning this array A to this variable bucket IDs. And then we're just using that method, or, or we're using that property right away. To, to make this shorter, we can just take the array and insert it in place of the, of the property, right? Like we don't need to necessarily assign it to bucket IDs to know that that's that variable because we're passing that value into that object method, which says it's a bucket ID, so we can infer that pretty easily. So now that we have that removed, we can remove this bucket ID stuff, and we can also remove its corresponding class properties so now we have a bunch less of those. So then I would think, all right, set min balls per bucket. Looks like we have some more class properties. And we can see at the top, when this test is initialized, min buckets per ball is initialized to zero as long, along with its other one. Um, so why don't we do the same thing? Why don't we just replace that with zero? So now we can remove that class property and now we only have one class property dist, which is our actual system under test. So you're probably thinking, okay, cool, but I just took you know eight, ten lines out of these tests that were really repetitive, and made it so I didn't need to have this state within this class. Like I really only need to know I'm tracking properties for this distribution. Everything else that happens within this test happens between the start of the function declaration and the ending curly brace. So let's jump into these like set min balls per bucket because I'm really curious what this zero value is. Like zero as an initialize and as an initialization property is kind of a weird number. And if this is a distribution, wouldn't that if I have zero balls and zero buckets, maybe that's an error case. Maybe uh, I don't know what's going to happen. So I jumped in there and I thought, oh, it looks like the class itself sets this property. So. Why am I setting it in my test case? Apparently I don't need to if it's initializing itself with this zero. So if I come back to my test, I can remove those because it's already going to be set when I instantiate it up there in the setup method, right? So my next thing was, so what is this run method and what does it do? And then why do I have to call get results as a separate, as a separate method? So again, I jumped into the class. I think I actually skipped a slide here when I was creating it. I jumped into the class and I found that get results, or I'm sorry, run at the very end of it stores its result in a class property inside that object. So essentially, the return value for run is equivalent to the same value I call for doing get results. So instead of calling get results, I can just say this distribution run. I'm already getting the same value back and I can continue on writing my test to see hmm, what happens when I run this distribution. So this would be about the time that I rerun my test case, rerun my test suite, and as you see in my slides here, uh, it passed. Um, so now that we have the test cleaned up, we kind of have a little bit better idea of what's going on. Uh, next we really need to figure out what's the responsibility of the class that we're trying to test. So enter SRP, the single responsibility principle, right? So this principle says that a class should have one and only one reason to change. And in our case, I added a little caveat to that that says, in that case, when it does change, you should try and preserve its public API. So in order for a well-designed class, we want to design it in a way that even further evolutions of the class can preserve the public API, so that way we're not searching all over our code base for method signatures, replacing things, and hacking on additional like true-false parameters, or all kinds of stuff like that. So let's look at our let's look at our class again here. Um, again, we're we're kind of looking at it and we're like, so what does this thing do? Um, that's a lot of a lot of public methods, and to me, that's a test or that's a smell. And by a smell, I mean, hey, hey, that stinks. Something's amiss here. 
So the smell that I'm identifying here is that too many public methods make it unclear how a class is supposed to be used. And that's a problem because we're the developer, we're trying to figure out, hey, I have this object over here, how does it fit into my application? So public methods communicate how a class not can be used, but will be used. There should be so few of them that there should be no question to you, how do I use this thing? And we can refactor our class here to communicate that much, much better. So we have all these public methods. Um, it's really hard to kind of like break them down and be like, hmm, so what does all these do? So I saved us the time and I sort them kind of by type. So we have some methods that set some configuration properties. We have methods that get those configuration properties. Uh, we have some runtime data there that actually ultimately gets taken into account when we execute run. We have some methods that run uses internally that I didn't find in the test or had to find tests for. And then we have these different get results, get status messages, stuff like that. So thankfully, run is well named. And anytime you find a method called run or main or execute or index action or whatever, it's probably your best bet to start there. Um, so, so my first thing with, with these public methods was find methods that are only used internally and then hide them. If I don't have any tests, well, if I had tests, what I might also do is then search my code base for like create ball ID pool and lucky me, that function is only used in this class and only used inside this run method. So what I can do is take these methods and just flip their visibility to private. So for the sake of our class's public API, it instantly just got smaller. We just got a little more focused and to figure out how we need to use this, how we need to use this class. So of course, private functions cannot be invoked outside of the method itself. So if I had an instance of this class somewhere, I couldn't call create ball ID pool that method can only be called within the code of like run or the, the constructor or whatever. So we can take those off the board. So with those hidden, I think we can, we can focus a little bit back more on how our tests and looking at our tests can guide how our code should look. And looking at them again, I found when an object's public methods must be invoked in a specific order to properly use it, that's a smell. Because how can we know, given this array of function names, which ones need to be called in which order? We don't, right? Other than our tests, which we're very thankful that, they ha that we have. But. So here's some rules for object instantiation. And when I say rules, it doesn't mean they can't be broken. It's, it's knowing when to break them, right? So an object should be ready to use and impossible to misuse after it has been instantiated. And this gets kind of tricky when you're used to having getters and setters for almost all values on your objects. So this definitely takes practice, it definitely takes forethought, and tests are a good way to help drive that out because you can eventually see, I need to do set bucket ID, set ball IDs before I call my, you know, my main method. So anytime you need to enforce this, you can enforce it through the constructor of that object. And that's what we're going to do with our bucket ball distribution. So here's back in our test. This is a, a, a separate test case than the one that I was showing before, but it's one that has more dependence on this min and uh, this min balls and min buckets. Uh, so which of these methods here are configuration properties? Uh, basically we have two of them. We have this min, min balls and min buckets, right? Like over the course of when this distribution is used, I hope that it's not the case that we would need to run a different configuration of this class. Like by saying, well, we're gonna run this first distribution, I'm gonna change these class properties, run it with a second set of data. Like what I would like to see is something where, and I'll get to this a little bit in a second, if you need a different configuration of a class, you just create an additional instance of it. You don't wanna reuse the one that you reused before, that you had before. Like if it's not carefully written, you might be having leftover state from the previous execution that could then confound your next results. So let's take these properties and let's actually move them to the constructor. Again, this is our test, so we want to model that first. So what I'm doing is I'm changing my setup method in my test to just be a build method. And I'm doing this as kind of a factory method deal where uh, the build method should follow the case that um, given these two properties, I can instantiate a copy of my class and it's ready to be used. And so I, I just changed it. And 
what we'll then do is we'll call build at the start of the method to invoke that. So now that we have our two properties being passed to our class, ready, uh, we can take our two config methods and we can actually just get rid of them. So again, we're, we're working on making our class and our tests even shorter. So our test now resembles how we think our code should look, right? But so now we need to jump into our class and actually implement that. If we would have run our test case right then, our test would have failed, we would have said, hey, dummy, you've got broken code. And that's a good thing in our case because it's telling us our tests are working. So we're gonna add a constructor here to our class. We're gonna pass in min buckets and min balls. We're gonna set them to their internal class properties. Right, Jim? Um, so these guys that we have there at the top were initialized as zero, but because we're passing them in in the constructor with default values of zero, we, don't, we no longer have to declare their uh, default value there in the property definition. So we can clear that out. So now we think to ourselves, why should somebody change the configuration of this class after it's been instantiated? So we don't want them to do that. So what do we do? We simply uh, re end up removing these methods. Um, so I think this is what I said a little bit earlier. An object's configuration should not change after instantiation. And if you need a different configuration, create a separate instance of the class. And now since we've made a pretty significant change to our code, we'll run our tests again, and our tests are fortunate to be green. All right, so we still have some corresponding getters here to these properties. And it's usually my thought that configuration should not, I'm sorry, so configuration should not be exposed outside of the class. Um, this is a kind of a tricky one to get right because sometimes config properties need to be exposed or you feel they need to be exposed. And I, I wish I had a good instance for when to do it and when not to, but um, I, I err on the side of not exposing anything at the start and then gradually opening up more methods to being public as I realize I need them. Instead of starting with everything public and then closing them off once I get the code working the way I want. That's just, um, you end up with other methods you either forget to, to remove or methods that are just plain incorrect. So we'll take our getters, uh, flip them to private because they actually ended up being used inside of this class. There was some specific calculations in there based on runtime data, based on like the bucket IDs and the ball IDs. So I just flipped them to private, so they didn't go away, they just are now hidden. Run our tests and we're green. All right, so if we look back at our test, we're still doing some setup stuff before our run command, and we, we realize we want to get rid of more of this. So let's look at the method implementation there for set bucket IDs and set ball IDs now. So we have our two methods here, nothing fancy going on, just two setters, just taking the value, setting it to the internal class property. So this is where we're gonna make our first public method API break. So we're gonna break backwards compatibility with this run method, and instead of setting these values via their setters, uh, we're gonna eventually inject them directly into run. So first we need to identify, where does this run method use these values? And we dug down here to this method, create ball ID pool, realize that it's using the properties for inside the class to do that, and we want to end up changing those to the injected properties. So before we get to doing this, there's some principles that I follow sometimes with class and method definitions, and that is I try and make my method stateless. Uh, that means that at the end of the execution of that uh, method, there's no leftover cruft inside the class that was dependent on the runtime data I gave it. So I just want it to run its calculation, give me a result, and then it's back to being pristine, exactly as if I had fetched it right after I created it. My method should also be deterministic, meaning given the same input properties, their return value should be identical. Same thing with idempotent, which is rather similar in this case in that given the same input, the state of the system should be identical when the method completes. Um, so those differ in really minute ways and idempotency is usually when you have a, a method that has side effects to it, so such as like persisting an object to the database, um, sending an additional email, modifying some other stuff in the distance. So we have this run method in our test, and we need to modify it to take basically the values of uh, these setup methods here. So we'll convert those to local properties, inject them into run, 
So now we need to figure out how does our class change to accommodate that. So we're back into our class. We have our run method here. We're going to add to that method signature an array for bucket IDs and for bucket balls. And then we have our two uses of the local variable or the class variable there. Substitute those in as well. And there were several, several other places in the code where I needed to do something similar. I didn't show them because it's, you know, no use of your time. So now we have these leftover setters, which we can now get rid of because our properties are coming in through the run method. We can also get rid of their corresponding class properties. So save by light of those. So next I'd start looking back at the run method and I think, so what else, what else is this run method doing here? And I dug into this create ball ID pool method because it's using our input parameters, right? Um, it ends up like compiling the bucket IDs and ball IDs into some special configuration and then it uses it in the while loop down there to ultimately do the calculation. And uh, it's not on this slide, but the create ball ID pool um, was actually setting this property up here, ball pool, which is again more state that I didn't want to hang around. Uh, so I just ended up removing it and assigning it to that local property there, uh, the ball pool value, uh, variable right before the while statement. Uh, yeah, and again, we, we run our tests. So yeah, okay, cool. So we ran our tests, and we've done a lot of changes so far. We've taken away a lot of public methods off this class that we inherited. Uh, here's where we're at. Here are the public methods we have left on this class. Um, we analyzed earlier that the run method has the same return value as get results. Um, into the code, we just see it's returning this results, just like it was at the very end of the run method. So I would safely say we can just remove it. So no, we no longer have a get results value. We instead just use the return value from the run method. Uh, and again, run tests, because that was a pretty big thing, right? Like, get results, is, it, feels, it feels weighty, it feels meaty, right? Like, we need, to make sure that our, <laughs> we need to make sure that our code works after we get rid of get results. Uh, so we ran our tests and we're green. So here's where we've come from and where we've arrived for part one in, uh, of what I feel like could end up being a, a fun series on the, on the second part two. Um, so yeah, we, we took all these methods that we had on this class, we didn't really know which ones to call, in what order to call them, what arguments they took, and we've kind of cleaned it up. Uh, we could say the responsibility of this class has been narrowed, and how it can be used in our code base is much narrower too. Um, so I have some other ideas on how we can improve this further, where we can end up getting rid of this get status message method and the get results by ball, but uh, yeah, time. So. If you're interested in learning more about this kind of stuff, there's some reading material here and some videos. So Martin Fowler's book, Refactoring, is considered a um, staple in the refactoring realm. And that's basically what we just did. Uh, I didn't cite any of his works here, but you'll definitely find some of the same strategies in his book. Sandy Metz is an icon in the Ruby community, and she also has this same less is more um, very strict design principles and things like that. Um, so she has a great video there called Less, The Path to Better Design. That is a great view if you're interested in this. And then there's an additional, um, additional video there by Katrina Owen called Therapeutic Refactoring, which is also very similar to kind of what I did where she goes through, she does it live actually. So she goes through, modifies her tests, modifies her code, runs the tests, everything works, and steps through the whole thing. So. Um, these, these three people have definitely inspired me and taught me a few things with that kind of stuff. But So yeah, that concludes my part one. Does anybody practice refactoring stuff like on a regular basis? Like write code, all right, it's working, or, and I have tests. Time to rewrite everything I just wrote, right? Like to make it better and whatnot. So. Yes, I have, and I do use them very regularly. When I have a case, uh, a data provider in PHP unit is, uh, so when you have a test case that takes in variables, you can annotate that, the test case with basically a method that returns different results that it throws into the test method, and it will execute that test each time for each um, input set. So if you have logic like I did, where I was testing certain, um, certain input values, I could have abstracted that out into a data provider return those result sets as one 
and basically had the same test, the same test code that exercises my thing instead of having 15 different different named tests. I was thinking that for that build function, you could have had a data provider there to build the different configurations and run the same tests. On Absolutely. Yep. All right. Um, hey, I finished one minute under 8 o'clock. That's great. Uh, yeah.